This is Keith Harabayashi Cook. I was nine years old when I saw this scene and was in awe. He was the fastest kicker I'd ever seen. A martial arts champion and competitor of the year in 1983, 85, and 86. He would go on to star in movies like King of the Kickboxers, Mortal Kombat 1 and 2, and Beverly Hills Ninja. With a famous martial arts academy since 1994, helping others improve their fitness and self-defense skills, Master Keith Cook is an inspiration. Today, I'm honored to get up close and personal with him. This is the Bruce Willow Podcast. Keith, Keith Cook, <laughs> finally we get to meet each other. <laughs> yes, this I always say, I always say this. Welcome to Portugal. Oh, thank you. Have you thank ever you. been to Portugal? I, I haven't. I'd, I'd love to visit there one day. I've never been to Spain or Portugal. So, uh, which countries have you visited in Europe then? Well, we we actually we filmed Mortal Kombat two in London, and then. Uh, I went to the WACO World Championships in Munich, Germany back, I think it was 87 or 88. And then uh, uh, just went, have gone to Europe before for a vacation, like in Greece and Italy. And then I did a movie and um, I did a movie called Born to Ride, which was, which was filmed in um, near Zagreb. And I love, I love that we were, we were filming very close to Venice and we used to drive to Venice on the weekends. And I love Italy, so. You traveled anyway. quite a bit for sure. Uh, let me tell you how I first yeah. saw you. Le I, when I was nine yeah. years old, I first saw <laughs> this documentary called The Best of the Martial Arts Films, which was yeah. narrated or hosted by John Saxon, who was one of the lead actors yes. in Enter the Dragon. And in the midst of Jackie Chan, Bruce Lee, obviously, Samo Hong, Gyeon Biao, there comes this long-haired dude from California <laughs> doing yeah. a triple kick with a red bandana and I was like oh my <laughs> god Keith Cook is one of the brightest new stars in the world of martial arts films here he is doing a triple kick in his film debut China O'Brien I got started back in about 1973 when uh, I saw Enter the Dragon do you imagine <laughs> can you imagine Keith what that does to the brain of a little child who's already into martial arts so I was like hooked. Uh -huh. yeah. I had to know everything about you. So I obviously rented China O'Brien 1 and 2. And I saw everything yeah. about Dakota. Then King of the Kickboxers. Yeah. Uh, then yeah. uh, uh, a movie called The Heat. Uh, uh, Heat Seeker. Heat Seeker. In Heat Portugal. Se yeah. you, know the, you know the translation in Portugal for that movie? Is Future no. Kickboxers. Oh, wow. <laughs> Nothing no, to do with it. Like... <laughs> So we shot uh, that one in about 10 days, 11 days. You, sh you shot a mo you shot the movie in 11 days, 10 days in, uh, in, uh, in the Philippines and one day in Rome. No wonder. <laughs> I, I mean, no wonder because your kicks are so fast. They were like, okay, it's a wrap. <laughs> <laughs> that was now, a, that was a great experience. It's a now, now please, please tell us and nobody's listening. Uh, <laughs> did you have, <laughs> Did you have to slow your kicks a little bit for Gary Daniels to, to catch up with you? <laughs> no, 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 he's, no. Uh, obviously he's a very solid martial artist in a lot of ways and a very nice guy too. Yeah. And no, I didn't slow down. No, I, I had to speed up for him. So you love that, you know, love when people challenge you and, you know, obviously he's, he's, he's really good. So. Yeah. No, with, without a doubt. I was just kidding, obviously. Um, let, me, <laughs> let, let, me, let me know a little bit of, uh, more about your background. So what old, uh, how old were you when you started doing martial arts? And which were the martial arts that you started with? 
Yeah, I, I started from a book, you know, and I, I was one of those kids who felt like, you know, I got picked on and stuff. And somehow I got my hands on a, a karate book and I was figuring out how to do the kids, the kicks and punches and stuff on my own. And uh, that was when I was about 12. So 11 or 12. And I had been beat up a few times at school. And, uh, you know, I wanted to learn how to defend myself. And then it was right after that that I saw, like, most of Bruce Lee's movies, you know. I think he'd already passed away by the time I saw his movies. And that, because I think that was 1973. And I know he passed away in 1973. And uh, that's when I saw his movies. And that's when I signed up for, I wanted to do Kung Fu, obviously, because that's what Bruce Lee did. I loved his attitude, you know, and that somehow, you know, I believed everything that I saw, you know, and I took that very seriously. I took that to heart, you know, I was like, wow, he is such a badass. I want to be like him, you know, and, uh, you know, I obviously believed that he was the baddest man on the planet. You know, I was just like, wow, man, nobody will ever mess with me if I can even get like a third of the way as good as he is or something like that, you know? So yeah. anyway, I was pretty inspired and I, I lived in Seattle at the time and uh, that's where I grew up. And uh, I went to a, at, near the University of Washington in Seattle, there was a street fair every year and I saw this Kung Fu demonstration and I was already trying to sign up at Kung Fu schools. I went to one where we knocked on the door. My dad took me and we knocked on the door and they wouldn't even let us in to watch a class. And it opened the door a crack, like it was very secretive. And I saw these swords hanging on the wall and stuff. I was like, oh, I don't think that's the place I'm looking for. And then I saw this guy doing a demonstration with some kids in, at this street fair. And his name was Roger Tung. And he ended up becoming my uh, teacher. And I was with him for about 13 years. And I think I was... It was kind of a lucky find for me because he was a black belt in Taekwondo and he, he was born in China and his fam and he studied Kung Fu in China and Tai Chi and he, his family moved to Thailand and you would think he would sign up for Muay Thai, but he, he signed up for, for uh, Taekwondo there. And he got, his, I think he got like the third degree black belt or something like that. And then his family moved or he came to the U S to go to college. And that's when he started teaching here. And so his school, it said Kung Fu, Karate, and Tai Chi. And I think he meant by the karate, Korean karate, you know. Although he was a black belt in Japanese karate, too. He was pretty, you know, he was pretty well-versed. Well well I loved the, you know, learning the Taekwondo style of kicking from the beginning. And, you know, I mean, you know how there's pictures of Bruce Lee with Jun Ri? With yeah, Master yeah, Jun yeah. Ri? Yeah, and of course. The, the, the legend is that he taught uh, Bruce Lee how to do a sidekick. Mm -hmm. So I, I love stories like that, you know. And uh, anyway, uh, my instructor had great Taekwondo kicking skills. And so that was one of the great things I learned there. Yeah. So it's, it's funny how uh, how one person can really change your life uh and and it, it's it's really excellent that that bruce lee still carries on that that legacy and that a lot of people or most of the people started doing martial arts because of bruce lee i i was yeah. too young i was too young to actually see all of bruce lee's movies at the time i was nine years old when i saw dragon the bruce lee story which was a, a movie based on bruce lee's life with jason scott lee and that got me yes. so hooked that from then on i really I, I almost nagged my mother until she finally enrolled me in kung fu classes was that kung fu that you were practicing in the beginning more traditional or more modern in in the acrobatic sense <clears throat> I think it was, uh, I think he, he was born in Shanghai. And I think what they were teaching there when he was a kid was already modern to a certain degree, not, not to the way Wushu has evolved now, but I think there was, you know, uh, he would call it Northern Shaolin, but actually, you know, I think it was always based on that long fist, you know, the long fist style. Tang you know, and I didn't know. Yes. And I didn't know that. To me at the time, Kung Fu was Kung Fu, you know, Taekwondo was Taekwondo, Japanese Karate was Japanese Karate, Jiu Jitsu was Jiu Jitsu, and it was more of the, 
you know, back then, uh, you know, it wasn't the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu so much. It was, you know, manipulating people's fingers and, but there was the choking and stuff, but uh, those were my distinctions. And then judo, you know, um, and then uh, later on, I got way into boxing because I was always, I always felt like one thing with Taekwondo is you're always, you know, I mean, not everybody, everybody does, you know, things their way, but I, I felt like, wow, you know, I'm standing back here trying to kick someone. You know, one of my coaches said to me one day, he said, he said that, uh, and this was later on when I was in my twenties, but, but it made a lot of sense to me, you know, like boxing and kickboxing and jujitsu, judo, wrestling, those things are not based on theory, which a lot of times, you know, Kung Fu, Taekwondo, they have those one step sparring things where, you know, somebody throws a punch at you and then they just stand still while you kick their ass, you know? And I, I, I was really, I think, really craving for more reality in what I did. Yeah. And I got really drawn into boxing. Um, there was a boxing club at the University of Washington and I was president of that boxing club for four years and I fought in a lot of smokers. And, you know, I didn't, I still wanted to be a competitive martial artist. So I didn't want to suddenly switch to boxing, but I wanted to learn from boxing. And I was a big fan of some of the great fighters like uh, Sugar Ray Leonard, Roberto mm. Duran, you know, from that era, Tommy Hearns. And then, um, you know, a big fan of Evander Holyfield because, you know, he, he would come off a punch and punch you right back, you know, get hit extremely hard, you know, and, and just punch you right back. And I was like, that's what I need to learn how to do because I'm always like, when I'm in the pocket feeling like, uh, 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 you know, and I wanted to feel calm and present. And because it seemed like boxers could be right next to someone, have them swing a really fast punch and duck right under it. You know, they yeah. somehow see it coming. And so just to develop that ability, that presence, you know, to uh, observe what's going on in every moment, I think every martial artist should box. I just, I just feel that it's yeah. really important. Yeah, especially uh, people who with a, a more of a kicking background that I can speak for myself because I was very much into the splits, into the Keith Cook and Van Damme and Bruce Lee kicks. And uh, all of a sudden, yeah, my, yeah. My, my fists were very long fists, were very wushu. And uh, wushu was a little bit more... Even with the modern stuff and when you do a lot of acrobatics and a lot of low, really low positions, uh, even with that, it's not like it's not it's not in terms of countering and in terms of real life sparring. It it doesn't have a lot to do with it, especially in the forms. I also competed in <clears throat> forms uh, like yourself. Uh, I find that it's interesting that uh, one of the things that I heard you say in an interview and believe it or not, China O'Brien, the making of is in is on YouTube. Have you found it? Uh -huh. Uh, yeah, you know, because, honestly, I can't remember. Yeah, if because I, not, I, 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 I was scrolling through YouTube. I just I just wrote China O'Brien. And obviously you have the whole film nowadays uh, uh, over there. And you also have the making of and on the making of you were saying yeah. something like you kind of uh, feel a little bit connected with the, the character Dakota because you uh, you trained most of the time. 80, 20, like 80% of the time you, you trained by yourself. Is that a fact? Even though you were obviously being uh, accompanied by a great teacher that, who taught you both martial arts? Well, yeah. I mean, uh, one of the things is, you know, I, I was at a job, you know, outside of, you know, my practice. I had to work and earn money. And What and did so, you do? If you don't mind my asking, what did you do? What kind of work did you do? Well, during that, that time... You know, where I was, I was going to the University of Washington, I was president of the boxing club. I always say I was majoring in martial arts <laughs> because, you know, that was what I cared about the most, you know. And I would do my classes, but that was kind of a side thing so I could keep going to the boxing club and, and stuff. And um, so I couldn't always find guys to train with me at the times that were convenient for me when I wanted to train every day. You know, so I, I, I trained really early in the morning before I went to work. You know, I'd get up at like five and I've still kept that schedule up really. I mean, I teach a 6 a.m. class Monday through Friday. So I, I still get up really early, although I'm teaching other people now. I, I do some training, you know, to stay in shape with that, too. You know, I, I do some of those workouts every day, too. So I stay, you know, fit and stuff. But that discipline of 
getting up very early and training started, you know, way back then around 19, I want to say around 1978 or so. And I pretty much kept that up throughout my, my life, you know, so. So how long did yeah, it take so for that, you? That thing, I, I, I've, if I didn't train 80% on my own, I wouldn't have been getting enough training in as far as I was concerned. I had to do it on my own. And, and you know, what's one of the things that I think is good about that, you become sort of self-sufficient. You become independent in, in ways, you know, where you have to get creative about, and, and you come up with ways of training because you, you know, you don't have anybody else to train with. And, and a lot of times, honestly, I had a hard time finding good instruction on things like, I don't know if you've run into that, you know, in, in, in things like defense, somebody who teaches defense, everybody's always teaching how to strike, but they didn't really teach how to receive the strikes. You know, uh, I found that part really interesting. And um, because that's one of the things, like if you do a lot of drilling on that, you feel a lot more comfortable, you know, in the pocket and stuff when you're boxing and stuff. If you train, actually drill on defense for boxing, it's one of my favorite things to do, actually. So. Yeah, I, I believe so because I've been doing a lot of boxing lately as well and the Olympic style boxing is one of my favorites because of what you just said which, which is like the hit and the counter and the hit and or the go in, hit and go out the, the always keep moving after the hit yes. and not just pow angling. and stay, staying there Yeah, yeah. I always say ins, outs and angles ins, yeah. outs and angles you know, and you got to keep your feet moving you got to be really good at And I love the footwork that you develop when you really get into this. And I try to teach it to people because if you don't have good footwork, good posture, good balance, you know, which are very fundamental things for, for any uh, martial art, you know, and I love the things that are universal, you know, that aren't, that aren't just locked up into one style, you know, but, and balance, footwork, flexibility, strength, endurance, posture, you know, footwork are all, you know, great things for whatever style you do you know would you say that back then people didn't have this even even though bruce lee was still you know was still very much instilled in their spirits uh would you say that back then people didn't have this much uh of, of an eclectic view of martial arts you know like taekwondo is taekwondo yes. you do taekwondo you don't go anywhere else w was there any sort of backlash from anyone or your colleagues or maybe people who for, from the martial arts that looked at you and you were like no 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 either you do wushu or you do taekwondo there's no fooling around yeah Yeah, well, you know, I think that goes back to something that Bruce Lee said, you know, like, like even in Enter the Dragon, the guy says, what style are you, you know, and he says, you could call it the art of fighting without fighting, you know, and I think that when you name things, you know, that comes right out of the Tao Te Ching. When you give something a name, it becomes sort of separate from everything else in a category. And people try to, you know, uh, figure out what you do by the name of what you do. And I don't think, I don't think you can figure it out because, you know, like I don't want to be limited by somebody's idea of what Taekwondo is or what, you know, boxing is or anything. And I want to be creative, you know, and one of the, one of the things I've had a, my martial arts school now for 25 years and, you know, I've made a lot of mistakes along the way, but I've also figured out some really great things that really work, you know, and You know, more and more as time goes by, I stick more to those things, you know, and it becomes more simplified, not more cluttered. I, I think there's something to be said for tradition, you know, and, and, and a lot of the things they had, they had right. But, you know, you want to have innovation, you know, and evolution, innovation, you know, and look at what MMA has brought us. You know, I think I love MMA. I love that you get to see guys really going at it and there's very little theory involved you know, and it's gone from a sport that was really only tough guys could do it to where now we're seeing technicians, seeing people who have mastered, mastered the sport, you know, of MMA. And, uh, and, and we're seeing, you know, where uh, different styles have dominated, you know, through different periods of the, of the UFC or, or uh, let's say MMA. And now, now it's really the guys who have, really hone their skills in everything that you need, you know? And so it's not just one style, you know? It's do you, what do really you, works. When so are you a keen follower of the, of the UFC? If so, who are your favorite fighters? 
<clears throat> well, yeah, I've had a lot of favorite fighters along the way, but uh, I, 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 I do want to say I, I love Con Conor McGregor, you know, because he's, he's, he looks like he has found a good balance in what he was doing. And he has, you know, like a really amazing front kick that penetrates so deep because, you know, one of the things, you know, a lot of people don't know this about me, but I fought a lot. I fought in a lot of karate tournaments. And, you know, being in the ring with somebody can be a lot different than what it looks like when you watch, you know. And he looks like a really hard guy to fight. And when you look at uh, what even happened when he fought, uh, uh, what is his name, Kahib? Oh, Khabib. Khabib, Khabib. yeah, Khabib, yeah, yeah. Khabib, Khabib. yeah. Yeah. Khabib, man, I mean, that guy is an incredible fighter. Khabib, wow. Um, comes from a wrestling background, but he can stand up with you. He can he can do all that stuff, you know, and I love that. I loved that, um, isn't it uh, Pettis? Pettis? Pettis, yes, yes, you yes, know, yeah. Whoever, yeah. Yeah, 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 sure. jumped off the fence, kicked the guy in the head and knocked him out, you know. Oh, man, and I yeah, was like, yeah. I mean, no, not silly, and then came in and, like, ground and pounded him. I was like, wow, that's... A, that's uh, somebody really using a movie kit, you know. But uh, <laughs> why do you think? Why do you, you know, think? I love that kind of stuff. The guys, the guys that can really kick and box and grapple. But I, I love it. I love the challenge of it. I love that the women fighters are doing They're tremendous incredible. in there. You know, I was just watching Joanna fight uh, uh, Waterson, the karate hottie. Oh, I, I and, didn't watch uh, that one. Yeah. Yeah, it just happened, and and I was a little disappointed, but with the outcome or or just the fight itself. But I I love the level of skill that that the women have gotten to in that sport, which in the beginning seemed like a men's sport, you know. And man, these girls can fight, you know, and yeah. it's amazing to watch the evolution, you know, and, and so I love it. I appreciate it a lot. And I'm still, still love boxing too. So. No, oh, that's incredible. So your, your, uh, your academy or your gym is based in Brentwood, California. Am I correct? Yeah. yeah. And you yeah. teach people, you teach people from all ages, right? From little kids to, to women for yeah. self-defense as well. So, um, yeah. And would you say it's a, it's mostly, it's mostly kids, you know? Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's where, uh, the martial arts is in, in America right now is mostly kids do it uh, for the traditional martial arts. And then as you, and so it's Taekwondo schools, it's Jiu Jitsu and, and uh, that's evolved a lot. I've, I've, you know, seen it and, and our emphasis on forms, forms, you know, it's yeah, yeah, way down you yeah. know, over the years, because, you know, for that reason, people want function. They want, you know, learn stuff that works, you know, and, uh, that's the way I feel. And that's what I enjoy teaching the most too, you know? So, uh, yeah, so we're, we've moved, so we keep moving away from it further and further and further, you know, yeah. and more towards, you know, uh, you know, kind of like a safer version of MMA and boxing, mm -hmm. you know, you got, you, if you get people getting punched in the head too much when they're beginners, they quit. You know? They quit, yeah. And yeah, so yeah. it's frustrating. And I want to, I want to run a successful business, and I want to help people get tougher. You know, I want to help them get. That's why we do a lot of offensive and defensive drills for boxing and kickboxing, so people can learn in a block and kind of take a punch. They learn how to take a punch, and then, and it's over a very, you know, you know, you hear of bringing up a fighter too fast, mm -hmm. and I think when you have clients in your studio, you don't want to bring them up too fast, you know, and so. We teach a lot of blocking and, and maneuvering and uh, checking, you know, a lot of checking, slipping, ducking, moving, angling and stuff like that. Yeah. And one of, and one of the best things I, I've learned through the martial arts is not not taking stuff personally. And people are we, we are in this uh, sort of society nowadays. And I, I can't get uh, enough of, of talking about this subject every once in a while with the political correctness and with everybody being so offended with everything and uh, people who are yeah. very and the youngsters are very, very much entitled. So how do we instill that sort of discipline in the youngsters? Well, I don't know if you, I, I'm just going to reiterate, you know, my studios in Brentwood, it's one of the wealthiest 
communities in Los Angeles, you know. So a lot of a lot of and a lot of kids who are spoiled, <laughs> a little spoiled. Some of the kids. <laughs> I, I think I think so, but, yeah. but also I think there's a lot of responsible parents, you know, who care and they don't spoil their kids, you know. Um, but there are those kids, you know. But but you know you find that in, I think you can find that in any economic level, kids get spoiled or they get brought up really well or. They get loved or they don't get loved, you know, and, you know, there's always uh, ramifications from that, you know, that you yeah. have to deal with. And, um, you know, you were talking about right before that you brought up uh, really, I mean, I just think, uh, you know, if, if you can teach a kid to appreciate hard work, dedication, discipline, you know, uh, we have on our studio wall, nothing replaces determination, you know, uh, education won't, you know, you've got to have that education won't, you know, like uh, being smart won't, you have to have that toughness and that, that, that sort of hunger to succeed, you know, at whatever the, it is you're doing. Yeah. And the consistency, I, I obviously. Kung Fu, the word Kung Fu doesn't mean martial arts, you know, it means to get good at something, which uh, there's also the implication of discipline and hard work in there. And uh, I think that that's what, you know, I want the experience to be about at our school, to people figure out, wow, this is really intriguing, you know, what I'm doing here. Now, do I have the, the toughness, the determination, the discipline to continue it, you know, and develop skill, you know, and that thing of, uh, what were you saying? It was almost like forgiveness, or um, uh, that you brought up. Um, oh, the, the entitle, entitlement. Exactly well, yeah, it was before that even the first thing you said. But but oh, be I I think you know you know like 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 you know can you, can you oh get uh, not, yeah not taking stuff not not taking stuff personally yes yeah, yes personally personally like if I you know get punched in the face. Can I take responsibility for that, you know, and not point out there, you know, and go, you punched me in the face. You know, we're all going to get punched in the face, you know, either, you know, literally or figuratively. Oh, yeah, know? or from and, life. Life will punch know, us in you, the face. Yeah. You know, you got to debrief all the time. What happened? Why did it happen? What can I do about that? You know, next time that punch is coming, I'm going to step over here and let it fly by. Or I'm going to I'm going to check it, lock it, you know, or I'm going to hit them first. You know, you, there's a lot of choices you have, you know, but to stand there and get punched, you know, and then blame somebody else, you know, you know, those are some of the opportunities you get to work on, you know, for, for sure, for sure. I, I believe I believe it's it's much tougher to make the world a better place. I mean, even though we obviously should try every day, but uh, it's much easier to make everybody a little stronger to cope with the negativity that sometimes might occur. Yeah. Um, so. From that point in which you were training like 80% on yourself, uh, by yourself and 20% with, with, a, with a master, with a teacher uh, and getting better and better, how did the competitions begin and how did that, uh, um, and how did that transform into the movies? How, how was that, uh, those two steps? Um, you know, I think, I think for, for a lot of martial artists, since, you know, I, I, I actually tell clients this and people who I work with that people used to get their education about what the martial arts was through the movies. Now, like these dads and stuff I see at the karate school, you know, they're saying, did you see Conor McGregor last night? You know, and so their, their education is coming from a different place. And that's why I think, you know, you can't really, you know, open up a, a martial arts school now and just teach movie kicks and stuff like that. You, you, you have to, you know, it goes back to that thing of real, function and stuff and you know back in the beginning I, I it took me a long i've always been a late bloomer at most things you know physically i was kind of a late bloomer i didn't get stronger until i was into my mid-20s i was getting starting to get a lot stronger and uh i still had a lot of success but i wanted to fight i always wanted to fight i wanted to be a, a fighter i didn't want i didn't understand really what the forms were, what wushu was. I thought these guys were supposed to be martial artists. Even when I went over to China, I was really surprised that they didn't fight. You know, I was like, why do these guys not fight? And then 
we've had this conversation a lot because, you know, I got into more interested in Japanese karate again. Where, where I grew up in Seattle, there was a lot of Japanese karate guys. So I grew up training with them, uh, you know, in some of that outside time away from instructor. A lot of my friends were into traditional Japanese karate. And so I became very aware of the right hand, you know, and dealing with the right hand and moving around. And I competed in a lot of traditional Japanese karate tournaments before I ever started doing forms. I was just going to tournaments to fight. Oh, I and, didn't know that. Uh, I didn't know that about you. I thought I thought yeah. you started doing the, the forms. Yeah. Yeah, no. I went to uh, China in 1990 uh, or 89. No, no. Uh, 1980. And I was already fighting in tournaments all the time before that. I hardly ever competed in forms because I didn't feel... Like I would go out there and try to compete in forms and I'd forget my form right in the middle and stuff like that. And so I mostly stuck to fighting and I got rated in fighting way before I got rated in forms. Most people don't know that. And then after I got to China, I actually got good at doing forms. And so I, and I made that a really disciplined part of my training too. But I always thought I was doing that so I could get noticed, so I could get in the movies, you know, and stuff like that, you know, and, and, uh, and just however I would get noticed. And so I figure if I was growing up now, I'd probably become an MMA fighter, you know, because that's how you get noticed as a martial artist now, you know, that's how, yeah. you know, those guys get noticed the most, you know. And so I would want to be wherever the action was, you know, and it was hard to figure that out back then. And that's why I took kickboxing matches, you know, like it'd be one of those things where you go, you weigh in, you're supposed to fight someone, you show up and they go, oh, that guy didn't show up. Do you mind fighting this guy who's 60 pounds heavier than you? You know, and it was, it was like that, but you know, it's, it was cool. It was, it was a good experience. That's incredible. You know? Cause you don't have a lot of people who can, can really be good fighters and good in forms as well. Cause forms, it's such a, it's such another talent show. It's like a dance. And, and sometimes I even believe you can make people fighters, but to make people good in forms in terms of the wushu and the correctness of the kicks and the and the splits, some people work their entire lives yeah. and don't get the split. So I, I believe that sometimes the barrier to entry with the forms is a lot harder, actually, or, or it's a lot harder than, than the fighting itself because we're all, we can awaken oh. our inner fighter in, in most people. Um, so it, is that... Uh, you did receive uh, a, an award for Black Belt Competitor of the Year. Uh, was it 1985? Yeah. Uh, 1985. And I got Competitor of the Year from Inside Kung Fu magazine also. Inside Kung Fu, uh, yeah. 19, I remember those magazines. 1983 yeah. and 1986. Damn. And, you know, I, I like to think that, you know, they, you know, because they used to say that I, because, I, you know, one of the things that made it hard to fight and do forms is you would the, your forms competition would be the very first thing in the morning and all the fighters are sleeping in and you're up there competing already. And a lot of my competitions were far away from my home and in a different time zone. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times you're getting up like three o'clock in the morning, your time and competing in forms. And then you got to wait for hours and then you compete in the fighting and those guys are just showing up, you know, and so that's why I think there's a very, you know, like, like people specialize, you know, um, and, and it goes back to that. Why, why am I doing this? Why am I, why am I doing a form? I don't see how that's going to help me defend myself, you know, but that warrior spirit thing is definitely there, I think. And I always tried to make my forms legit and powerful and that I was doing something that had real function, but I could have spent that time you know, making myself a better fighter, definitely. Yeah. And so yeah, but, sometimes uh, I wish I, I wish I wouldn't have done the form thing, you know. But you, you were kind of reminding me of, of a story by, by that actor, uh, Jamie Foxx, because he was saying that when, when he was a, a young kid, his grandmother made him uh, play the piano. And he hated to play the piano, oh. but he got very good at it because she ordered him. She she would uh, force him right. to, to play the piano. And then like 20 years later or 25 years later, all of a sudden this role for a movie comes in to play uh, Ray Charles. And yes. all, all of a sudden it's like, oh, we're casting for Ray Charles. And he's like, oh, really? Did you know I know how to play the <laughs> piano? And boom. So. What were the forms, the main vehicle for you to get noticed by Fred Weintraub? 
Because that was the first. Uh, yeah. That, okay, that was so the first connection with the movie really business, right? Yeah. Tell me yeah, about it. And, and I had moved, my instructor, Roger Tung, had moved down to Los Angeles. And so that gave me a good excuse to move down here um, in 1985. And because um, I could work for him. So I was basically running his school in his martial arts school. And he could travel all around and do his whatever he, his other business that he was really interested in. And I would run the school and uh, I kept competing in tournaments and I did get noticed a lot for, that's what made me train harder at the forums because, hey, now I'm finally, I'm really getting noticed, you know? And so I, that was inspiring for the forms training too. And uh, one day, so I had traveled with uh, Dave Cater. I got on a couple of professional martial arts teams with guys like Billy Blanks. You oh, know yeah, Billy yeah. Blanks is, right? Or yeah, of course, Ibo. of course. The we bad guy from King of Kickboxers. Yeah, we did King of Kickboxers together. Yeah, Prong versus... In, too, in that alley fight scene in China O'Brien 2. Exactly. Um, and I've known Billy for a long time, you know, since 1988, probably. Uh, was it... No, 1982. Sometime around that time is when I met Billy. Just at a national karate tournament. And then we end up becoming teammates. And so we had training camps together and I got to train with them. And then since we lived out here, we started getting together and training after he moved out from Boston to L.A. And um, so I knew him, you know, before the whole Tybo craze and everything like that. And, <laughs> yeah, you know, he was, he's a tremendous martial artist, tremendous fighter. And, you know, he's mostly famous for Tybo. But, you know, he was a real fighter. And I saw some of the best karate matches. Of, I saw him fight Jeff Smith. In Bermuda, you remember Jeff Smith, the kickboxer? No, Jeff uh, Smith, I don't. Kickboxer, one of June Ree's students, tremendous world champion kickboxer and point karate fighter, but he was a Taekwondo guy, and he came out of retirement because there's this sponsor. It was like going to enter the Dragons Bermuda tournament. You know, they flew all <laughs> the best competitors in. They flew the judges in. I was in heaven. I was like, whoa, yeah. what happened? You know, and then all these old fighters came out of retirement because it was exciting. You know. And so I got to see uh, uh, Billy Blanks fight Jeff Smith. And I had some great fights there at that tournament, too. But, uh, yeah, I mean, um, got off subject a little bit. So I was down here, and Dave Cater, the, the, uh, the editor of In Inside Kung Fu Magazine, had become good friends with me because I was traveling around, and sometimes he would travel with the team. And so we flew to South Africa together to fight the South African national karate team. And I got to know him really well on that flight. And then um, uh, he'd been at various other things, the Waka World Championships in Munich that time. And we, we became friends. And Fred Weintraub called him to see if he knew of anybody he thought would be good for this role. And he recommended me. And that's how I, how I got that. And one day I had got home from my morning training session. I hadn't even changed my clothes yet. And the phone rings and I pick it up. And he's like, hey, this is Fred Weintraub. I was like, Fred Weintraub, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's pretty funny. You know, no, this is really Fred Weintraub. Fred Weintraub who produced Enter the Dragon. Yes, because it was, I hadn't done anything yet, you know, other than a Gatorade commercial. I did a Gatorade commercial. And there would be no reason why Fred Weintraub would be calling me that I knew of. And so I, I was a little taken aback, you know, I was just like flabbergasted that he was calling me. And... And he says, I want, I want to meet you because Dave Cater told me about you. And he says, I should interview you. And I go, okay, um, let me take a shower and change and I'll be, no, he goes, he goes, I want you to come over right now, right now. Don't do anything right now. And turns out I only lived about a mile away from his office. Wow. And so I was there like within about 10 minutes, you know, and I was standing in front of Fred Weintraub and his daughter, San, Sandy Weintraub. And he goes, and the first thing we sit down in the room and he goes, he goes, uh, so I hear you're a martial artist. And I, I was so pumped up. Yeah, he goes, I hear you do martial arts. I stood up. I go, you want to see some? You know, it was, it was like that. You know, I was so ready, so fired up, you know. And, you know um, How old were you? How old was, were you? Were you like 20? I must have been, I was, I was like 26, maybe. 26? 25. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Such yeah. an incredible opportunity. That goes to show that yeah. opportunity does show up. We just got to be ready, right? We got to be ready for the opportunities yeah. that come. 
you know, over the years, I, I don't think I was as hungry, you know, to be in the right place at the right time, so to speak, where, where you just have to be everywhere, you know. And so I got a lot of opportunities just from people I knew and stuff like that over the years. And um, that King of the Kickboxers, uh, you know, some of the auditions, I had a lot of fun on them too, because I would go for it on auditions. You know? <laughs> if they wanted me to fight someone, I would fight them. <laughs> if they wanted me to demonstrate a weapon or whatever, I just came ready, you know, I was ready, you know? And I think that that would show up, you know, in, in my audition, you know, compared to other people because, you know, maybe they wouldn't be as ready. I was ready. Let me tell you, I was ready. And, and so, um, because I knew I wasn't, you know, like a true actor, like who had studied his craft and all that. Although I did after that start training an actor because I didn't want to be working on your ready, skills. Not yeah, ready yeah, for the yeah. audition. And I, you know, but usually the auditions were, this was <laughs> the first part I got in Hollywood was really funny. It was, uh, this was right before the China O'Brien thing. I did a movie called, and it was for, with Playboy Bunnies oh. in Hawaii. And it was, it was called Picasso Trigger. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you, you were killed in a motorcycle or something, right? Weren't you in the yeah, motorcycle yeah, and you get yeah. killed? Uh, I watched it. Motorcycle. I watched it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right, a motorcycle champion named Bruce Penhall. He was a world champion motorcycle rider, and it, it was it was so much fun. But uh, the audition, the guy goes, "Give me a sheet. Here's your lines." It was like, "Hey you," you know, something like that. "Hey you," and then the guy goes, "I go, I go, hey you." He goes, "Oh, that was great." And he goes, "He goes, can you do a backflip?" And I go, "Sure." <laughs> <laughs> and so he goes, "You got the part." You know, <laughs> yeah, so good. <laughs> it's just funny. And then that time that I auditioned for King of the Kickboxers, yeah. I can't remember how exactly I got that audition, but I think I might have had an agent at that time. Uh, although they probably could have figured out how to contact me anyway, because that the guy, Keith Stramberg, who wrote King of the Kickboxers, um, was really good friends with a guy named Keith Vitale who was a yeah. competitor who I knew. And so who knows how they got my name, but they called me in and, you know, who was standing uh, out in, in the lot, who was sitting in the lobby was Don, the dragon Wilson. Who I'm sure wow. You know. and, yeah, of course. I, I know, Benny I know those Ukides, names, obviously. Benny Yukides had already re auditioned before I got there. And so I knew that the, they were, you know, the competition was tough and they were looking at, you know, world champion kickboxers and stuff to play this kickboxer role. And dude, I was so ready. I was so ready. I get in that audition and that the, uh, they called him NG, the producer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he had me do read lines and stuff like that. And then he goes, okay, now I want to see some martial arts. He goes, Lauren, Lauren, Lauren Avedon, you know, the star. Oh yeah, Lauren. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. Was there in the audition. He was there. He already had the part, you know, he was... Basically, it was built for him, the movie. And he says, Lauren, stand up. Do some martial arts with him. I was so ready, let me tell you. You kicked his like, ass. I just started. You kicked I his ass. I started whomping on his ass. And I bet you, <laughs> even to this day, because I don't, he's a great martial artist too, but I was so pumped up. You know, this was another audition that he had to sit through. But me, I wanted to kick some ass, you know, because I wanted to get the part. And so... I started, you know, I figured this is kickboxing. I started kicking him on his legs and then I do a jump spin kick and just miss his face by like that much, you know? And then I was really kicking him though in the body and the legs. And I was just like relentless all over him, you know? And I looked over at the producer and he was laughing. He was, he was just like, oh my God, he was just, he was just like, so anyway, I ended up getting that part. So it's good that you played a drunkard. <laughs> <laughs> it's good yeah. that you play the drunk. Yeah. It's like, oh, whoa, whoa. Because nowadays, uh, sometimes <laughs> I work as a stuntman, and a lot of the times we get people who are, you know, they're new to the business, and so they're really pumped up and they really want to hit. And it's like, no, 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 this is oh, pretend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is play pretend. So, but I guess that when when you're young like that and you want that part so bad, you're gonna do that stuff. But I'm glad nobody got hurt. Yeah. And can can you please say this for me? Hear the sound of one hand clapping. Can you please say that for me? 
Hear the sound of one hand clapping. Ah, that's what I don't like about the martial art. It's this mystical jumbo <laughs> shit. It's something, it says something like that. And you say something like, worthless piece of shit, American. I heard that. And you're like, I wanted you to. <laughs> See, I remember yes, all the yes. lines, man. I'm your yeah. biggest fan. Come you're on. Than me. You're, no, you're no, no. Than me. no, no, no way, no way. Hear the sound of one hand clapping. What the hell does this stuff mean? That's the trouble I always have with the Orient, this mystical shit. You really know what it means? Of course. Okay, tell me. Doesn't work that way. Have to find out for yourself. Bullshit, you don't know. Do too. Now get back to your meditation. I'm listening to a fucking drunk. Worthless piece of shit, American. I heard that. I wanted you to. Um... Then Mortal Kombat comes along and you become yeah. one of the brightest young stars in terms of the martial arts. You did not only the Mortal Kombat the movie, but you did also Mortal Kombat Conquest. Am I right about the series? It's no, the name I of the series, I've right? Only done, no, I haven't done any of the series. I only did uh, oh, Mortal oh. Kombat 1 and Mortal Kombat 2. Oh, movies. the two. I thought, I thought you were in the series yeah. as well. So you played Reptile no, in one and Sub-Zero in the other. Yes, yes. Yeah. So yeah. how was that experience? Well, I was trying out for, you know, and I thought I had a shot at it. You know, I was trying out for the Liu Kang role oh. in the first one. And I went, I must have gone to, I want to say five callbacks. And it was all acting. It wasn't, it wasn't, uh, mar they didn't ask me to do any martial arts yet. I didn't get to that point, I guess, before yeah. I got eliminated. And a really good friend of mine, Robin Shu. Robin Shu, yeah. Uh, got the, got the part, yeah. Um, but then I end up getting called back later, uh, after they'd already finished the movie and they wanted more action. And actually Robin asked me to come in and do that fight scene with him. That's how I got the original, the, uh, reptile role. And that was a great experience. One thing I forgot to mention, I just want to mention it really quick is sure. on the King of the Kickboxers one, um, there was a director, you know, and they, they, they do it a little differently. Although I think some American films or Western films have come around to that too, where you have a action director and you have a sort of drama director. Oh, okay. And yeah. They had that on this film, um, on, on King of the Kickboxers. But that one day that we filmed that one fight scene that I did, uh, uh, as praying where I kicked all those people you know, with all this, the jump kicks and everything. Um, that was uh, choreographed or, or directed by Corey Ewan. Yes. He only came in for, for that one fight. And I feel like it was a really big honor. I didn't even realize at the time who he was, you know. But then, you know, uh, it, what I did notice was when he got there, they were all like, Corey Ewan is here, Corey Ewan is here. They're, you know, the cast, the crew, all of a sudden shaped up, it, they became like soldiers, you know, and everybody got really quiet, you know, and I loved that, that just that respect that he had earned, obviously earned. And um, he, he, rather than telling me what to do, he would go, okay, these guys are gonna come from here. What do you wanna do? What are you gonna do? And I go, I could do this. And he goes, can you do this? And I go, yeah, I could do that. And then you go, good, let's go with that, you know? And oh, so that was the way that fight came out. And it oh, was so, only, yeah. you know, we rehearsed, we, we blocked it and rehearsed for about, I want to say the whole thing was done in like five hours, you know, mm -hmm. which I think was really because he's such a professional, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, it's good that he kept an open mind in terms of what can you bring to the table, and then you went along with it. Yeah. Uh, and just yes. just to finish, just to finish on the movie on the movie uh, subject, how was it working with the director of Enter the Dragon? How was it to work with uh, Robert Klaus? Oh, I, I think he was really he, he was really easy to work with. Really nice mm -hmm. guy. Um, and I, I end up working for Fred. Weintraub a lot and you know became friends became friends with his daughter Sandra and they uh, I don't know if people know this but he was trying to he thought I was going to be the next Bruce Lee you know he was really got behind me was trying to help me and he took me to uh, to Golden Harvest Studios and I actually one day they had an office in Beverly Hills at the time 
and they offered me a five picture deal. Um, and I probably would have moved to Hong Kong, you know, similar to Donnie Yen, you know, yeah. maybe, uh, he was actually, Donnie Yen was on the same trip. My first trip to China, we went there at the same time to train in Wushu, you know, wow. um, his mom was a really famous Tai Chi for Austin. And anyway, uh, and I almost, I actually sat down with, uh, um, oh no, uh, the head of Golden Harvest. Oh, uh, Raymond Chow, Studios Raymond Chow? With Raymond Chow. Chow. Yeah. I he just passed away it. like oh, two yeah. years ago. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And he, he to interview me because they were thinking about doing this five picture deal. They offered it to me and I wasn't doing anything at the time. I wanted to take the deal. And I had this lawyer who was like, Keith, if you're getting that deal, you're going to get, you know, some kind of American deal. You know, you don't want to just run off and make movies in Hong Kong. You want to be an American action star. And I was, I was still sold. I wanted to go do the deal. And he just kept messing around with it for so long that they thought I had a, I think they thought I had a bad attitude, you know, like, Oh, oh he must bad, think yeah. he's a star, you know? Yeah. And, and I could see how they could think that, you know? And, and so after a while, like six months or so of just messing around with that deal, they just said, forget it, you know? But was so, there something about your, and um, if, if you don't want to answer this, it, was there something about your attitude back then that you would change or was it really the back and forth yes, with the lawyer? Yes. Oh, yeah. I, I definitely had a little bit of stars in my eyes, you know? Oh, like, like, so it, did, did it I go to your maybe, head a little maybe bit? This, did it... Maybe this lawyer does have a point, you know? Okay. And, you know, and, and I, I really wanted the deal though, because I love the idea of working with, whoever Bruce Lee and Jackie Chan worked with, you know, and, you know, why wouldn't I want to work with those guys, you know, and, and learn, you know, and I really did want to do that. It's just, you know, I, I don't know what went wrong, but I do, I do kind of feel, I mean, I feel responsible for it and I feel like it was a, a maturity thing. I wasn't mature enough to make a, a decision based on what I was passionate about at that time. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, but it's not, I, I guess know, it's not, bl blaming ourselves for that is, is really not worth it because we, we all know those guys in, 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 they're sharks, right? They're, they're always sharks. And, and sometimes we, yeah. one might think, oh, they want to take advantage of me, of, of me or, or something. And we all know that this is yeah. a crazy world and everybody wants those parts. So I'm, I'm sure, yeah. I'm sure your head in, in a way was at the right place. So who can blame you? I mean, you, 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 yeah. you did X great movies and you obviously things turned out great for you so nowadays and uh, i don't know if i if i'm allowed even to say this but you had a birthday and yeah you you look you hardly look a day over 35 you well, hardly look a day maybe, uh, so so the lighting <laughs> no it's not the lighting so how how do you still keep so fit and do you have any sort of uh, excellent dietary habits as well to go along with it? Can you give some tips to our audience uh, on how to keep this excellent fitness throughout the years? I've always been into fitness and I've told this on a, a lot of interviews is that when I was competing, I never wanted to lose because the other guy was in better shape than me. That would be a horrible reason to lose because that means I didn't have as much discipline or determination as the other guy. Talent, that's another thing. If somebody kicks my ass because they're more talented, I can't really do that much about it. Although a lot of times, you know, I found that the most talented guy isn't always the one who wins because somebody else had enough determination. It's like the, the rabbit or the hare and the turtle, you know, you know, like a lot of these with a lot of talent eventually get passed because they don't have the discipline and the determination. And the guys that are way at the top, way at the top that are elite athletes, Usually they have, they have that talent and they have discipline and determination, you know? And so it just got ingrained me after all those years. And so I've always kept myself in really good shape. Um, I've always kept up my sparring and stuff. Like when I moved down to Los Angeles, I got hooked up with another teacher named Steve Fisher, who recently passed away also, but he was, 
a great friend and I used to train at his studio, which was really in, you know, a tough part of LA, like the hood. And so you fought real tough guys there and boxing, kickboxing, karate, you know, in the studio. And, and I love that. But back to the, the fitness thing, um, I've never been somebody who likes sweet stuff. And I remember when I first became interested in sports medicine, I, I bought this, it was a green book that everybody had. It was called the sports medicine book. I think. Oh, really? yeah. And they talked about things like carb packing. Do you remember that? You know, like a marathon runner. Is it, is it like car oh, car oh, car oh, carb loading before a, a, a carb loading. A, 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 yeah, carb before loading. a competition. Right. Yeah, 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 sure. Yeah. yeah. They would sort of starve themselves of carbs and then right before the competition they'd eat a whole bunch of carbs so their supposedly their muscles and everything could could store more yeah, carbs the glycogen. Than normal yeah. as fuel. Yeah. I was sort of, you know, trying to eat a lot of carbs at the time and stuff. And it didn't really affect me back then because I was burning so many carbs. I mean, so many uh, calories and stuff. Yeah, yeah. But as you get older, I think you got to get way more aware of what you're eating. And even though I'm very active, I can notice a difference in the way I feel and the way my body responds to different foods. And uh, I, I started teaching boot camps about, uh, about 20 years ago, a little over 20 years ago. And we would alternate with strength days and cardio days. And the cardio days were basically kickboxing classes. And the, and the strength days were uh, resistance tubes used in all kinds of different ways. And I've gotten very into using, I still use resistance tubes a lot. I love training with resistance tubes because of the thing that it's, I feel like it's so much better for your joints. And there's so many things you can do because you can create resistance in any direction. You're not relying on gravity for the resistance like you do with a weight you can only push it away from the earth basically yeah. whereas a tube i can look it up a push down you know i can push you know horizontally you know and and so you can do a lot more things with them if you're creative and i just think they're really healthy for the body so i've, I've used those and um uh there used to be a guy called uh, i think his name was bill phillips and he wrote a book called body for life which became a bestseller and um, there was this kickboxer um, who started a, a boot camp program based on that, but with kickboxing and tubes. And it was based on the diet from Body for Life though, where you you do a, a protein, you know, thing the size of your hand, like a chicken breast, the size of the palm of your hand. And, oh yeah, and, and it's, then and your it's meal, yeah. could, could only be the same size. And so if you had rice, it would fill up the palm of your hand, you know? And so it, it got people to balance out and he wanted you doing that times a day, you know, like six portions, you know, so that your metabolism stays fired up and stuff. And so I was on that for a long time. I was eating five to six meals a day, you know, and stuff like that, trying to balance my protein and carbs and stuff like that. Now everything has changed. You know, they talk about insulin sensitivity, you know, and all of this stuff. And, and when you pick up food, basically, is how much insulin is that going to trigger if I eat that, you know? And uh, I don't want to trigger insulin, basically. And I do believe that, you know, all the, you know, what we've seen, and I heard we're seeing it everywhere now, too, is is uh, obese diabetes, type 2 diabetes from yeah. abusing carbs, basically, abusing sugar. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just think it's really important to be aware, you know, and uh, to never overdo that. And to try to use carbs that have fiber in them, you know, which means vegetables and fruit, basically, which are very yeah, healthy. Yeah, lower glycemic and, foods, yeah. And so, yeah, and because I don't think our bodies are meant to have, to be uh, responding with insulin all the time, you know, constantly, yeah. constantly. Mm -hmm. And that's why it causes a lot of havoc inside the body and stuff. And so I'm a big believer in staying you know, keeping the carbs under control. And now they've found out the whole thing with the, the keto diet, with the, how you can use fat and, you know, and, and so I'm really into all those things, you know, and, and uh, the paleo thing and, you know, <laughs> yeah. that, you know like, so my, my diet is sort of paleo-ish, you know, and, and to two meals a day, basically with an eight hour break and then a 16 hour break. Oh, meal. so you do. Oh, so you do intermittent fasting as well. Yeah. Yes. And I so, found that to be really a really solid system. And when I 
when I get boot camps now, that's what I put people on. Yeah. I put them on, I try to get them down on the carbs, way down on the carbs, and then put them on that intermittent fasting. And it, it seems to work for almost everyone. Yeah. You know, because yeah. when you're down meals, it's only two times a day that you have an opportunity to mess up. You know, when you're trying to eat five or six meals, oh my God, I found that so many people would overeat, you know, taking in way too many calories, you know. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, exactly. I, yeah, I, I mean, uh, uh, so, 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 uh, your first, do you usually do the fasting in the morning or at night or do, do you stop eating early or do you uh, start eating later on the day? Well, first of all, like my first meal is usually around 11 o'clock okay. in the morning and I've already taught two classes, you know, taught a, you know, a kickboxing class and a strength training class Yeah. by that time. And I've used workout. Okay. And then I, I have my first meal, which I usually take in some carbs, you know, I'll have a portion of rice or a portion of pasta or something like that with a really solid protein source and fat, and then some vegetables. Like, like, uh, I, I like using spinach because it's, it's easy. You know, I like convenience too. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. preparation spinach, you can use it as a salad. You can use it, you can cook it in with something with a protein source or, you know, and I eat a lot of eggs, a lot of whole eggs. Like I don't, I don't try to stay away from fat at all because, um, unless it's really unhealthy fat, because I just think, you know, fat is the one food group that has no insulin response whatsoever. It doesn't trigger insulin yep. and the triggering of insulin and the storing of sugar in your fat cells is people fat. And so fat doesn't make you fat, you know? And protein has a very low insulin response, you know? And so it's things, it's sugary drinks, desserts. And, and the other thing is, I don't like desserts. I never, I've what? never been a, a, a sweet tooth, you know? Um, I mean, that's not completely true. I, I love, <laughs> I love like, I love peanut butter yogurt, you know, and stuff like oh. that. Or I used to like peanut butter ice cream. And I used to wow. make milkshakes and put peanut butter in them, you know? Oh, that's but, incredible. I, I love know, it. I'm saying now, and so I had to, I, I just pretty much gave up desserts. I don't really eat desserts anymore at all, unless somebody, you know, like somebody's birthday, I'll have a bite of the cake so they feel honored or something like that, you know? Or <laughs> yeah, if, yeah. if somebody made a cake for me, I'll taste it, you know? But I'm, I've got really good willpower as far as sweets go. Excellent, so, excellent. Anyway. Keith, it's been such an honor. I'm just going to ask you uh, to tell people or to give people or newcomers an advice in their own lives, like for fitness or for martial arts. If you had one message that you could give to the world before we wrap up, and if you want to plug in something like uh, where can we find you and uh, any uh, sort of uh, stuff that you might be working on right now that we w you want everybody to see. I'm just going to share three things because um, I have to go back to the ancient wisdom that I appreciate so much. And I appreciate that Bruce Lee was such a student of, uh, I think, uh, Taoism or, you know, the Tao Te Ching, the book. And, you know, when he talks about water and stuff. But, you know, there's an ancient Buddhist saying that says, don't hold on to a hot rock and hope that it burns somebody else. And I think it has to do with forgiveness and you know, uh, you know, a lot of times we're mad at someone and that person isn't even thinking about us or they're out at a party having a great time and you're like, oh, I hate that person. Oh, and that's what they mean. You're only burning yourself. You're holding onto a hot rock and hoping it'll burn them and it's not burning anyone but yourself. And so I tell all my kids, we tell people that at, at, at the karate school. Um, the other thing is uh, I, I got into reading actually stuff by uh, the Dalai Lama, you know, I, I probably need to get back to it, but um, they have this one word and it's SOPA, S-O-P-A, and it means patient forbearance in the face of adversity. So they have that one short word that has that meaning. And so how important do you think they think that that patient forbearance in the face of adversity is? And that's what I think the martial arts teaches us. Be patient, you know, hang in there get tougher, you know, and you'll make
kit, you know, but I love that they have that one word and it's all over his books, SOPA, SOPA, you know, and I thought that, that was really cool. And uh, uh, one more, <laughs> sorry, is uh, in the Tao Te Ching, which I think was, you know, just, just based on how, how passionate Bruce Lee was about those things, you know, yeah. about water containing shade, be like water. Yeah, it'd be like my water. My friend. Yeah. Yes. Um, that same book, there's one that says, do you have the patience to wait till your mud settles and the water is clear? Can you remain unmoving till the right action arises by itself? The wow. master is never seeking, not expecting, thus is present and can welcome all things. And it makes me re, uh, remember the, the creator of Aikido. Um, what are you, said, Yeah. Yes, Ueshiba. He said, he said, invite your opponent's attack like you're inviting a guest into your house. And if you can get that centered, it's, that's where, you know, can you be under attack and still remain present, you know? And I, I love that, you know, and I, I think that all those things kind of lead you in that direction. And so those are the things that I think Bruce Lee was inspired by. And so I'm, I'm inspired by, by those same things. Keith, thank you so much. Let me just say that uh, uh, for everybody to follow Keith Cook on the YouTube channel. You got a lot of great tips there. Small, short movies. And I love the fact that you don't give a whole intro like a lot of fitness I videos. I want to get more like you. I want to get more like you. <laughs> I, I want you to do more. I'm always waiting for more. I watched it yeah. like 10 times each one. And I'm like, whoa, he hasn't posted anything in a while. Is that how you got started? We got, got started? Yeah, I got started. With my, my first video was like... Uh, a lot of people ask me what to eat and when to eat because I'm also a personal trainer. So my first video was like what to eat and when to eat. And everybody loved it because it was like uh, um, uh, a short way of knowing the the A through Z of what to eat. So it was like basic stuff and direct message to everybody that really wants to know what to eat and when to eat. So it was like it, it, it kind of grew from there. So from the acceptance yeah. of the audience, we started doing more and more and more videos. And now we have the chance to do this podcast and we have this studio. So I'm very happy with that. Well, you're, you know, you're a super likable guy, you know, and I got oh. <laughs> that from watching the videos that are out there. And, uh, you know, so I can see why, you know, you got so many followers and everything, but congratulations to you on that. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Keith. It's been a pleasure. So please keep posting. Please keep posting on your Instagram. We plugged that all, that, 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 uh, those uh, networks in. And thank you so much. And I hope to see you and catch you once again soon. All right. Take care. Take care. Take care. Thank you so much. was fascinating with the, your brother Philip Ree uh, who obviously played Tommy Lee in the movie Best of the Best and he was saying mm -hmm. you guys had a really tough upbringing so you started uh, you started uh, tr uh, training martial arts Hapkido with your father am I right? No that's not right um, 